Okay, so that brings us to Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Um, out of all of the Russians, uh, it's Tchaikovsky who's remained the most famous. Um, the Mighty Five uh, had mixed feelings about him. Uh, he was a conservatory snob, um, but he was a Russian conservatory snob, and he wrote Russian music using folk melodies. Um, he really had a very Russian voice. So he kind of straddled that line. At first there was hostility before between them, but then the Mighty Five started inviting him to have his music premiered um, at some of their concerts. Um, unlike the Mighty Five, Tchaikovsky had a really spectacular and inexhaustible, inexhaustible knack for melody. Um, just think of all the hummable tunes from 1812 Overture or um, the Nutcracker. His sense of melody made him an internationally renowned composer. Um, while he really made it as a composer socially and personally and emotionally he was kind of a mess he was neurotic he was nervous he was a hypochondriac um he was homosexual which uh, if he lived now there would be a total non-issue but at the time he ran into um a lot of trouble um with that mostly a lot of it was self-induced um he opted to stay in the closet and to avoid the impact that that might have on his professional career um and that could have gone, it's a little unclear exactly how that would have gone, but um, had, he, had he been out. Um, so the, the weight of his, his sexuality secret exacerbated his neuroses. Um, he was really skilled at hiding his emotions though, um, except in his music, where his music is just plaintively, deeply emotive. Um, he confided everything to a very small group of close friends and then to everybody else he played the social game. He played it really well, he kept up contact with the right people. Um, though he had learned what to say and how to act, most of the time he just wanted to flee from the world. Um, he, he was precocious as a child, he had learned French and German by the time he was six. Uh, he was very sensitive emotionally, especially sensitive to music. Even as a kid, he would get music in his head and he would scream to take it to take it away. Um, he grew up in a middle-class family. They moved to St. Petersburg in 1850. And at the age of 14, he started to toy with composition. Uh, though in school, he didn't have any formal study. He became a lawyer. He graduated in 1861 um, from law school and commenced on um, a series of travels. Uh, he was 21 when he started to study music seriously. And then a little later, the St. Petersburg Conservatory opened, and one and his primary teacher started teaching there. So he moved and started studying at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And then Rubinstein, who was the director of the conservatory, took an interest in him and sort of took him under his wing. Um, he, among other things he had to study at the conservatory, of course, was conducting, and Tchaikovsky hated conducting. He was terrified of it. Um, that sort of public exposure um, was not his thing. And he used to have this peculiar habit of holding his left hand up against his chin, supposedly to keep his head attached. He was so terrified of conducting, it made him so uncomfortable that he had the sense that his head would fall off in the middle of it. Um, in 1866, Tchaikovsky took a teaching post at the Moscow Conservatory. Um, he kept composing and sending his scores to St. Petersburg and elsewhere. Um, but while at the Moscow Conservatory, he met a woman named Antonina Ivanovna Mil Mil <laughs> Milyukova, and uh, she had kind of a hero crush on him. She admired his music, and he decided that it would be a good idea to get married. And so uh, they're married. He thinks it's going to be a good workable union. It's going to be good for their career. It's going to help them appear respectable. Um, he, he thinks he's made it clear to her that it's going to be kind of a working relationship. Um, she doesn't quite get it. Uh, he writes that she proves to be surprisingly unintelligent and also apparently has a tremendous sexual appetite, um, which does not go well for Tchaikovsky, the closeted homosexual. Um, he descends into a nervous breakdown. He writes uh, that he's made a, a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, if he, if a few more days of it and he would have gone mad. He attempts suicide by throwing himself in a freezing river in an attempt to catch pneumonia. Um, he gets a terrible cold but doesn't kill himself. His brother, who's also gay, rescues him uh, and they flee to St. Petersburg. Tchaikovsky completely falls apart. His marriage is over after nine weeks. Um, his wife 
moves on um, and has a series of relationships with other men. Tchaikovsky continues to support her financially and eventually she dies in an insane asylum in 1917. Um, so that happened in 1877 uh, that he met um, Antonina. Also in 1877, he begins to exchange letters with Nadezhda von Meck, who's, um, uh, we all need a Nadezhda von Meck in our lives. She was his patroness. She um, supported him financially for many years, and her only requirement was that they never meet in person. She knew his music, she loved his music, she wanted to support his music. Um, she offers to subsidize him but they are never to meet in person, which is fine by Tchaikovsky, of course, because he doesn't, he's not a social person. He doesn't want to meet people. Um, but he has a correspondence, uh, a letter correspondence with her, um, much like a, you know, an online relationship would work now. And he's very, very um, attached to their relationship, um, but they don't meet. Twice they have, um, twice they have, um, encounters where they're at the same concert and he just tips his hat and then they blush and they run off. Um, he writes to her, I'm not at all surprised that in spite of your love for my music you don't want to make my acquaintance. You are afraid you will fail to find in my personality all those qualities which you are idealizing, which your idealizing imagination has endowed me. And in that you are quite right. Uh, so I think he nailed it. Um, regardless, uh, they keep to their pledge. Um, the Vani von, from Von Meck allows him to resign from the conservatory, he buys a country home, um, and in these letters that he writes from the country home, we learn a lot about him. He doesn't care for uh, all the music of Beethoven, he likes some of it, but not all of it. He really thinks Wagner is boring. Uh, he doesn't care for Baroque music at all. He does like classical music though, Glinka, sorry, not Glinka, um, Gluck. Um, Haydn he likes, Mozart he thinks of as a musical Christ, he adores Mozart's work. And it's kind of interesting that these composers that he admires, the classical period, that is a time that's really, um, its emphasis is on form, it's on the development and the establishment of musical forms. And the composers of the day play in and out of these different forms. Um, Tchaikovsky had a knack for melody, but it was form that he was sort of throwing himself, that was the wall he threw himself up against. Um, he, a lot of his music has, you know, very well developed form and is sort of driven formally, but he struggled with that his whole life. So it's kind of interesting that that was um, the, the group of musicians that he most uh, looked up to. Tchaikovsky had a major setback in 1890 because Nadezhda von Mack, out of the blue, stopped funding him. Um, and it wasn't just, he could have dealt with the funding stopping, but his, he was shattered because she also cut off the letter writing entirely. Um, it's possible she found out that he was gay and didn't take that well, um, but uh, it's a little unclear exactly what happened. She thought she was going to go bankrupt and so stop paying money as possible. She was embarrassed about that, but at any rate, he writes, all my conception of mankind, my faith in the best of it, has been overturned. Um, he was really broken by that. He was shattered. In 1891, shortly after that, he's invited to go to New York to share in the opening week dedication of what was later to become, um, later to be called Carnegie Hall. And he was really taken by the American people. He was taken by sort of the frankness and the openness, uh, the social openness of the American people. Um, there was in big contrast to the, the, the layers of propriety that existed in his world in Russia. Um, he comes back and he writes his final great work, his sixth symphony. Um, it's now called the Pathetique Symphony. Um, and Pathetique means not pathetic, but pathos of emotion. Uh, and his brother had suggested that he call it the Tragique Symphony, the Tragic Symphony. And Tchaikovsky actually liked that, tried to change it to the Tragic Symphony, but it was too late. The wheels were sort of set in motion by then. Um, and it was a programmatic piece of music, a la the way that Berlioz wrote program music, he wrote Symphony Fantastique about Harriet Smithson. Uh, Tchaikovsky writes this programmatic piece of music, but he makes it very vague. The idea is that the, it's programmatic for him, he's written it about something specific, but the audience isn't supposed to know exactly what it's about, and the audience is supposed to glean their own meanings from it. One critic really nailed it, saying that uh, it was a homosexual tragedy, and that may very well be where Tchaikovsky was coming from. 
Um, uh, adding to that tragedy is that a week after its premiere in, in 1893, Tchaikovsky was dead. He was 53 years old. Uh, he drank a glass. The, the official story is that he drank a glass of unboiled water, contracted cholera, and after a few days of intense suffering, uh, that was that. He was gone. Um, but there's a lot of scandal. There's a lot of controversy about that theory because he would have known to boil the water. It was a no-brainer. Everybody boiled the water because cholera was such a big deal. So maybe it was intentional that he had drunk the unboiled water, but why? What had happened? Um, a group of British musicologists have a sort of flimsy conspiracy theory that has actually gained in popularity um, that he had had a uh, kind of too public, sloppy um, affair with a man that was going to out him um, and that he had killed himself, either that he had killed himself with the water or by taking arsenic that had a sort of similar um, set of symptoms, um, or that there was even sort of a, a what's called a kangaroo court where a group of people came together and said, look, um, we know this about you and to protect your honor, um, you can you can kill yourself if you'd like. Um, it seems a little far-fetched to me, but uh, it was a different time and a different place. Um, Tchaikovsky's principal lover toward the end of his life was Vladimir Davidov, nicknamed Bob Davidov. He was also a nephew of Tchaikovsky's, um, and Tchaikovsky had dedicated the Pathetic Symphony to him, and had also named him as the inheritor of all royalties from his music. Following Tchaikovsky's death, Davidov helped Tchaikovsky's brother build a museum in Tchaikovsky's honor, and when that was finished, Davidov turned to drugs and later suicide in, uh, in 1906. He was 34 years old. Um, so Tchaikovsky, all in all, had a, a, a dramatic life, a tragic life. Um, where does that leave us? Where does he fall as a composer? We're talking about Russian nationalist music, but he was ha he, he had one foot in the European camp and one foot in Russian folk music. Um, where does that leave us? What do we make of Tchaikovsky? Um, Here's what Harold Schoenberg eloquently writes on the subject. He says, quote, Later in life, he was not so consciously nationalistic. From the beginning, of course, his music was slanted more to the West than to the music of the Five. But it would be a mistake to eliminate Tchaikovsky entirely from the school of Russian nationalistic composers, different as was his approach from that of Mussorgsky and Rimsky-Korsakov. Where Rimsky-Korsakov spread out his arms to embrace Russian antiquity and folklore, where Mussorgsky spread out his arms to embrace the entire Russian people, Tchaikovsky spread out his arms to embrace himself. But it was a very Russian embrace.